next up we have John Ham. Hey, he's there. He may have been here the whole time and it's not showing up on my list. I don't know. But I can't hear him. I don't know what I need to do. He's right there. Hold on. I need to click the button. I see it. I click this one. Oh, he's there. there. No, hey. hey. I've been I've been here. I did I did I just I just strolled into town. So <laughs> I see you just strolled up on your horse. You got a loop on the tire. Uh, 1800s. <laughs> That's awesome. I have no idea how long you've been there. I'm sorry I didn't see you there earlier. I think of the no, Texas. I, just, I really, there. literally just strolled into oh. town. All right, good. It's all right. I was, and I, I I'm, still, like, I'm still getting myself set up with the slides and all. Give me, give hey, me just a sec. Yeah, you got like 15 seconds. Better, better hurry. I'm, I'm what? on a sharp, a sharp clock here. I. People All to right, talk on. to and things to th other things to to do and more banter to have. Hey, how's the weather? I uh, know. Well, let's see. I have to. Is it as give myself as presenter? Can... Oh, I can probably do that for you, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's got to do that. Because uh, I, can I can't, that. I can't throw my slides. All right, that's better. The problem with 4K uh, monitors is that... you can't see anything more than uh, a couple inches away. Oh, look at Discord. All right. There we go. Oh, that is beautiful. It also looks so that is easy. Half Dome in the Grand Tetons. Oh, beautiful. Thanks to Apple. Is well, it that's nice? about to be not as nice. It's about to be a set of slides. So I got that going on. Uh, do you refer to landslides because of fires or uh, or slides because of an investment uh, opportunity to turn into an entertainment park? Honestly, every it seems like everybody's moving here from uh, California and Colorado. Here, here being Missoula, Montana, for those of you who don't know. Oh, hi, hi. Okay. for those of you joining us, hi, hi, my attendees, all 131 of you. Hi, I'm Jonathan Ham. I'm just joining, strolling into town. I'm now a minute late, waiting for my slides to start spraying up there, which they'll do. Give it a moment. Um, so here's the deal, John. Uh, we've worked together in the past with BHIS, and uh, no one gave oh, yeah. me a no one gave me a bio bio for you, so I was like, "Hey, John Ham's coming up. I, I've worked with him. I can tell you a lot about him. He's got long hair. Uh, he <laughs> he doesn't live near me. That's all I really know." <laughs> well, I can uh, I'll I'll fill I'll fill in a few details once I have some slides to to fling. I'm waiting on keynote to stop beach balling, but it worked a moment ago. So give it a second. I, I'm I'm throwing slides from a wimpy little MacBook Air. That's I also think, doing my green screen and my cam management and all that. So give it, give it just a second. Oh man, um, we were having a heck of a time in our class yesterday because we have uh, our screens are green screen, so we can kind of chop out bits and, and do overlays and stuff. And yeah, we were running 100 percent for like three days straight. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure right now my CPU is pegged, and it was bad. working just a second ago before I left the the test room before I came into the classroom here. And well, so the, I'm the watching test room is yeah, my, test not my really drops it off. Hey, no, stay, stay. I promise. We have slides. <laughs> have a talk. I can, I can give it. I will. So we're talking about threat hunting, right? We've been talking about threat hunting, and uh, I think Zeke from Saved by the Bell is is what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, here I'm gonna I'm gonna turn up the volume so I can hear you a little bit better. There we go. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead, even even without the introductory slides, and I'll come back around to a little, a tiny little bit of bio. But I don't, I don't believe in giving a whole lot of bio. I mean, if you want to know who I am, Google's your friend. You can find me. It's not that hard. My name is Jonathan Ham. As long as you spell it with one M, you'll find me. If you spell it with two M's, you get that actor from Mad Men. That's not me. Oh, <laughs> there we go. On read as well, doing that one. What's oh, that? Right. I said that might also be just as fun to, to read up on, though. But at some well, point, you think, you know, well, maybe I don't it, have the right John. All right. See, now I'm seeing I'm seeing slides up here. Yeah, there, there we, go. we go. This, if this okay. was a real emergency, that's where we're supposed to be. Right awesome. on. All right. So, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the slide deck as read. I got a little bit of bio. I'm easy to find, but I don't believe in a whole lot of bio. I'm not here to toot my horn. I'm here to do something that I hope will help people learn to do something next, right? That's what I'm, that's what I'm really after. And I can see I've got a pretty big lag on the slides because that clicked back and forth a bunch. 
All right. So well, I got, uh, I got I'm going to turn my that. video off. It might help when I turn my video okay. off. So I'm going to go off. I think it's going to be all you. And if if you have trouble, I'll jump back on. But otherwise, I think it's going to be you. If you okay. need us to turn the well, slide or something, we can try that. Yeah, I can't. I'm um, just stay stay tuned because I have had some issues with the internet here in my office. But it's it's just I, I can see right now it's a little bit laggy, but not not too bad. It'll catch up. It'll catch okay, up. it's almost like the it's internet really up in the mountains in Montana is probably not the best. All right, I'm going off, sir. Good luck. Hopefully, me turn my hopefully me turn my video off will help your machine. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Well, this is this is still gonna work. Just can't let me know if I totally just freeze up and you can't hear me, and then then call me. All right, I'm gonna go. So this is no longer a test. If this were a real emergency, there you have it. Hold on. Let's see. Let's see it come up. Lag, 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 laggity lag. Wow, bad lag. All right. So I, I adapt to that. I know I'm going to be teaching a lag. If this were a real emergency, our ambulance would show up and help you, but not it, not available for COVID-19. So I'll just flip past that, and you'll see you'll see that that's not the case. All right. So here we have the talk that we're given. Zeke ate a worm. Ew! Zeke ate a worm. Gross. And you can see here's why network forensics. It's still a thing. All right. It's still absolutely a thing. So the very, very brief, who am I? This is the way I like to uh, present it, honestly, just as briefly as I possibly can. Although with the lag, it's, there we go. Here's the groups I belong to, the everyone group, everyone belongs to that. Um, within the rendition domain, I'm part of the threat hunting obsolete group. It's an optional group, most people aren't part of that. Uh, within the SANS Institute domain, I'm a principal instructor, an optional group. Most people don't belong to that. Within the author domain, I'm a member of the Network Forensics group. That's also an optional group. I think StrandJS has a read on that group, at least. But then we get into who am I with what privileges do I have, right? So some, <laughs> I, you can see, if you, if you know your Windows privileges, you can see that I've taken some liberty with these. The SD debug privilege actually exists, but I've taken some liberties with the description. That's the privilege whereby I can understand what Relic did just now. After his keynote speech, I did not catch. I don't know what Relic's up to these days, but the last time I saw him do a keynote from years ago, he was dancing around doing some crazy stuff uh, with PowerShell, just like, oh, hey, here's a cool PowerShell thingy, and did the thing, and I was like, dude, I don't know what you even did there. I, I don't have the skill to know all that. That's not my thing. The stunt hacking privilege to impress all the hacksors here at Wild West Hacking Fest, that's not my thing either. <laughs> Rocket surgery, I cannot perform impossible feats. But there are some things that I have as enabled privileges, one of which, see the packets. I can see all the packets. Hear the glass break. See the bad guys. I can do those sorts of things. And then the SE blue team privilege, defend all my stuff, I got that. So there's, there's that, all right? So what's all this thing? So for the last three years, Wild West Hacking Fest, I've been, I've been working on demonstrations, a trilogy of them actually, of threat hunting quick and dirty. And that's what Kent was, was bringing up is, yeah, I've been doing these threat hunting quick and dirty talks for the last three years. And you can see seasons, season one, episode one, two, and three, they're all found on Wild West Hacking Fest YouTube channel. So you can go back and you can see those. Go back and look at them if you want to, they're all there. This was originally booked. If you look at the schedule, this is supposed to be season one, episode four. But then I realized, no, no, no. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm channeling George Lucas here, and I've decided to start a whole new season, season zero, the prequels. And season zero, episode one, ew, Zeke ate a worm. Why the prequel? Well, because if you look at seasons, season one, episodes one through three, I presume a whole lot of knowledge about Zeke and how Zeke works, and what Zeke can do, and a lot of command line stuff that I know a lot of people didn't come into it with. And I got you know some good feedback from folks saying, well, we, we still kind of understood this stuff. But you know, a lot of it just was like, I get it kind of conceptually, but zoo, right? So I decided, all right, let's go to a prequel season. And what we're gonna do is start out talking about a particular target of a hunt segmented worms 
These have been around for tens of thousands of years, 500 million years ago. Back to the Cambrian period. Now I'm talking about biological, actual, the phylum and, 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 uh, and Alita, and <laughs> Alida, with tens of thousands of species, five, 500 million years ago, and they continue in the modern internet period to continue to emerge. So in this new episode of season zero, we're gonna explore the use of Zeek and some other command line interface tools to look at how we can study these beasts. The interest in Helm mythology, which is the uh, which is the study of uh, parasitic worms specifically. So that's our focus this year: a wormy intro into Zeke. Now here's our roadmap, as you'll see when the slide switches. A little bit of lag there. We're going to start out with some boring stuff: some taxonomy, some lexicon, and stuff, and some evolution of worms. We're going to start off with history. Now, if history bores you, tough, tough. Suck it up, Buttercup. I just, I've got a 13 year old who is, she's, she's in high school now, however it may be, and she's acing her classes. She's acing her history class. We were talking about her history class. She hates history. She told me, I hate history. It's so dumb, it's so useless, I hate history. And my heart just died inside at that moment when she told me, I hate history. I'm like, yeah, but it's so useful. But then I remembered myself when I was 13. And I remember even how I thought about that. I'm old enough now that I can say things like, get off my lawn without irony. And so I get now in, in retrospect why people don't really dig history. But even, even 20 years ago, maybe I thought that his, internet history, so useless that if you know the last five years of internet history, anything before that can't inform you. I'm here to tell you it can, and I'm gonna show you. So that's where we're gonna go next. Starting with, when's taxonomy? What's this whole taxonomy thing about? Before we even get to the history, we're gonna talk about what this is. Now in biology, if you're familiar with this, the idea behind taxonomy is it's a systematic classification of organisms. We'll catch up here in a second. Basically, if you've got oceans of different things that you need to understand, it can help a lot if you can leverage what you know about specific entities, specific organisms, whatever, to help you understand what the things about the things you don't know, right? Now, in biology, historically, this is done along evolutionary lines, with, with uh, Linnaean taxonomy specifically, very, very commonly, where the things are related because they evolved from common ancestors. So because they're, because they're biologically, really, biologically related through evolution, we kind of categorize them that way. Another way of doing this taxonomy can be through common features and common behaviors, because different organisms evolving from different entire lines can converge on the same behaviors and, and the same adaptations, and that can be useful for us to understand as well. So we're gonna, we, we don't use that as much in biology, but we're gonna use that here. Now within, within malware, when we're talking now about cyber entities, there is a total sea of malware taxon taxonomies. So much been written about this. And unfortunately, they're not consistent in their goals. Are we talking about a lineage of malware? This, this code base evolved into this code base, which is modified into that code base and so on and so forth. Is it a recombination of code bases? This library combined with that library that gets into that sort of thing. Is it about behavior? But there hasn't been a lot of consistency in this in these malware taxonomies, right? Also very inconsistent in nomenclature and structure. So the result is it can be useful, but not consistently useful, unfortunately. So what we're gonna do is set a goal of categorization, taxon taxonomic categorization, based on identifiably malicious behaviors, because that's really where we're gonna go to try and detect what kind of evil are we trying to detect? What kind of evil are we trying to fight? Before we even get to the how do we go about doing it, we gotta understand what's the threat we're after. So we're gonna go after, to begin with here, at least a description of a little simplified malware taxonomy. And we're doing this based on the Linnaean model, which is a hierarchical model. Many of you, if, if you had biology in high school, you gotta be familiar with this. At the bottom, we got the genus and species. 
For every organism, it's part of a genus and a species. It's a species which is which is part of a, 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 a an overarching genus, which is part of a family, which is part of an order, and so forth. But in the malware world, this whole genus and species approach brought us nomenclature like W32 slash config or A, or W32 dot down at up. Those are the same things, just different vendors, different nomenclature for these genus and species of these evil things. So this was primarily over history. This has primarily been the realm of AV vendors, ostensibly to enumerate all variants of evil, because we're going to find all the evil, all the possible variants of evil, we're going to have all a name, all a genus and a species. Now, um, if that seems like a fun thing to mess with, go ahead and tune out from here, track two, switch yourself over to track one, where Jeff McJunkin next door is talking about how to mess with the AV vendors and bypassing all of their identification based on all these nomenclatures. Go, go nuts over there, because that's what Jeff is going on about this hour. Meanwhile, we could pop up a layer and look at families. So the families consist of all these genus and species, but then we can now categorize them more broadly as, is it an APT? Or is this genus and species part of crimeware? Or is it a ransomware sort of thing? Or is it a spyware sort of thing? But, and this has been more commonly adopted more recently. However, as threat-based as it is, and that's useful, the problem with this is, and, and that's useful for profiling, the problem with this is, this is pretty vague, because we can categorize something as ransomware. But if you're doing ransomware, isn't that a crime? Isn't that crimeware too? Aren't the APTs criminal? And aren't they doing spyware kind of things? I mean, they overlap, so it's too vague, too Byzantine for a real solid taxonomy. So let's set all that aside. What we're gonna do is pop up from species, up to genus, and up from family, up to orders. So we're gonna talk about the major orders of malware. Starting with Trojans, as the slide will flip here in a second. Trojans. We've got three basic orders, major orders of malware. Trojans are apps that you decide you want. You go surfing around, well, pro hopefully not on the app store, but you go looking around for some app that does what you want, and it looks really good. It gets good ratings, whatever, and it looks like it does what you want, so you invite it in, like the actual Trojan horse in Greek history, right? Uh, uh, Greek and Spartan history, you invite the thing in, but they contain more than you actually wanted. They may do the thing you want, but they, do, they contain other stuff that you totally don't want. They contain evil. So that's a Trojan. Then we get to the second major order of malware, viruses. These, um, the, the, the major distinguishing feature of this, these are bits of evil code that can insert themselves in your environment by attaching themselves to trusted executables. But the, but the uh, real distinguishing characteristic of that is that they require a user to take some action to launch them, to facilitate their operation, and to begin their replication throughout the environment. So they only really replicate at user clicky speed. And bad enough, but it's not as bad as the third one worms, which is the focus of our, our discussion today because these distinctions really are profound. What worms are, they are standalone executables that can insert themselves into your environment without any user interaction. They attack some network-based vulnerability commonly. And after the successful attack, they begin their automated replication of themselves and begin automated uh, propagation of themselves throughout the network. They move at network and CPU speeds, not at user speeds, right? Which brings us back to our roadmap slide saying, all right, next up, the evolution of worms, moving on into our history. Now I'm gonna take you back, and this takes me back, I'm not even as old as this, right? 1966, I'm younger than that. 1966, John von Neumann. If you're not familiar with John von Neumann, one of the most famous mathematicians in history, an absolute uh, polymath. He was, he was famous for so much stuff. But one of the things in our realm that he got famous for was his, his uh, paper on the theory of self-reproducing -repro autonomy. Back in 1996. Now, he actually had some help. It was based on a series of lectures in 1949 
that uh, he had a, he had a helper help him kind of compile these into a paper. You can see the reference to it at, at the bottom of the page. You can you can find a uh, you can find that and you can look into it. But the history, the references, keep in mind, and I will publish these slides shortly, not immediately, but shortly. In any case, what John von Neumann was doing back in 66 was just an exploration of natural versus artificial automata. Natural being neural systems, biological neural systems, comparing them in aspects like density, performance, and, and so on and so forth, to artificial automata at the time, which were still vacuum tubes largely, but his speculative conclusion is that artificial automata could be built that could self-replicate. And this was, this was an earth-shattering concept. No one had thought about this really up until that point, which is why it's a seminal paper. And it's actually, I mean, if you like history and you like reading about like when people started thinking of things that, wow, we didn't, that's when we started thinking of this? I find it I find it interesting now, but again, I'm old enough that I can say non ironically, get off my lawn. Anyhow, five years later it took before we had a proof of concept. From Bob Thomas of BBN creates an ARPANET worm that does in fact automatically self replicate throughout the ARPANET. Kind of cool. It wasn't until four years later that a fiction novelist John Broner came up with the term, coined the term worm based on segmented worms and worms moving from segment to segment to segment in a cyber way. And that's where we got the term worm as a point of malware. I think that's kind of interesting. 1975, where were you in 1975? Then 1988, of course, the Morris worm. I mean, no, no history about worms would be complete without some reference to that. You can read all about it all over the place was the very first widespread, well-known, damaging, internet-based, all over the place, point of concept, or proof of concept, and that's what it was. I mean, Robert Tappan Morris sent it out to prove that all these network-based vulnerabilities were imminently exploitable in a bad, bad way. When you put it out there, he was actually not at MIT. He was studying, uh, now, now it escapes me where he was studying, not at MIT, but he launched it from MIT to make it look like it came from MIT. But in any case, it was also the first Computer Fraud and Abuse Act indictment and the first Computer Fraud and Abuse Act conviction, whereby Robert Tappan Morris did in fact get convicted of computer fraud and abuse, served probation and community service and that, and now he's a tenured professor at MIT, ironically enough. But in any case, it's a good history for you. Moving on to the next era, the rise of the worms in the early 2000s. Code Red, V1 and 2. Now I'm gonna start moving even faster because I'm gonna start moving into history that some of you may recognize, but probably only the oldest in the, in, in the uh, audience will, uh, will even recognize a lot of this. Code Red, V1 and 2. First really truly successful propagator, though kind of limited because of the way that it worked. It was also quite benign to the affected systems themselves. It didn't do a lot of damage to each individual system that it compromised. But from the enterprise perspective, it was quite impactful because you had to go out and restore all the systems that the propagation impacted. At that same time, we can see the Warhol paper coming out from, from Nick Weaver, which modeled the optimized propagation of beasts like this. Because what Code Red 1 and 2, or version 1 and version 2 of Code Red did was they randomized their target selection for propagation, but with a static seed for randomization. So they didn't do a very good job of what could have been. He modeled this out saying, well, what if there was heavy leaning towards subnet permutation? So you're scanning more within your local subnet a little bit less within a larger subnet, a little bit less within a larger subnet, and some of the threads for scanning and propagation are dedicated to wherever, right? Then in the same year emerges Code Red 2 and Nim to both, which were basically point of con uh, proof of concepts of Weaver's model from the Warhol paper. By the way, the Warhol paper named for, uh, for uh, Andy Warhol who famous equipped, among other things, everyone's gonna get their 15 minutes of fame because what uh, Nick Weaver at all had, or what Nick Weaver 
in that first paper had proposed based on this mathematical modeling is that a properly uh, constructed worm could saturate all vulnerable devices on the internet, compromise all vulnerable devices on the internet within 15 minutes. That was the 15 minutes, hence the name Warhol, right? And then Code Red 2 and Nimda came out and basically proved, proved the concept of his model with non-static seeding of the randomization, but also with some uh, subnet permutation to more heavily lean their, their generation of random IP address for targeting based on local versus remote subnets. So much more effective in propagation. Then we get on to the flash paper, which was uh, Nick Weaver, but also bringing in uh, Stu Staniford and Vern Paxson from Zeke fame these days, which was a year later, titled How to Own the Internet in Your Spare Time, the subtext of the flash paper, whereby the model basically said, what we're gonna do is precede the ground zero host. So instead of launching it against one host, the compromise is two, the compromise Hey, it looks like John Hamm's having some internet troubles. He's frozen in a look of pain right now. So, Jonathan, if you can hear me, plug your computer back in. Yeah, it's frozen. I'm, uh, it is frozen. It is well and truly frozen. Let me see. And he's gone off completely. I don't have the slides nor the knowledge to continue the conversation. Um, Joff, are you are you here yet? We can talk about some other things, perhaps. So old, early worms. So 2001, 2002. These are these are before I got involved. I got involved in like 2007, 2008, and that was more like um, what was it? Configure was going on then. And uh, I remember that was that was a hot topic of discussion in my first uh, the first class I took to learn any sort of hacking techniques. I learned about Configure and Netcat on the same day. That was kind of kind of a lot to absorb all at once. Let's see what we have coming up next. We got um, we got Adam is coming up next, talking about uh, insider threats in about 25 minutes or so. He's the the VP at Scythe, uh, VP of Product Management. Jonathan Hamm has returned and ducked right out again immediately. There's something very dangerous going on. It looks like there's a gunfight going on behind him in that street there. So he's trying to he's trying to keep himself alive. He's got to react fast enough so that he doesn't get hit with any like bullets or shrapnel or anything. My phone's ringing and it's not Jonathan, so I'm not going to answer it. Uh, he's very nearly back. Very nearly back. He's uh, he's in the camera now, but uh, the sound has not quite arrived yet for us yet. That's the next thing is the sound. Can you, now can you the, hear sound me? Is, the sound is back, and Jonathan has survived the gunfight. He is our winner, and he is back <laughs> and ready to continue. This is amazing. Um, the action you, we've got going on for you today. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you so he's down much. again. Can you see my slide? No, he is back again. Uh, yes, we have a match tossed into the dumpster is what we have. Sweet. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to blast past a bunch of the history. And and because this has happened, I'm going to post the slides like as soon as I can today, at least as soon as I possibly can. So that so that you guys don't have to have to wait because I'm going to have to I really am going to have to get through a bunch of this too fast, unfortunately. You will, you will do us, you will do us all proud. Keep going. You're, you're fine. I, I you're wanna, absolutely I fine. Get to the, uh, I, I want to get to the fun stuff and get past the history lesson that my daughter Charlie hates so much. Bottom Go line. On. Back to you. The, the, all right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, the bottom line is 2003, 2004. For at least in my experience, that was when the match got tossed into the dumpster. I mean, I, I know everyone was talking about 2017, 18, 19, dumpster fire upon dumpster fire and, and garbage fires and crazy, crazy stuff. But honestly, there was some record setting movement throughout 2003 and 2004 that just was a sea change in what we were dealing with. This interlude on Witty, 
I'm, I'm, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna leave this as a uh, as as a um, uh, an exercise to the reader. Go go read up on Witty. The uh, the reference that you have at the bottom of your screen from the uh, Cooperative Association for Internet Data Analysis, CADA at UCSD. They covered this. The thing about Witty and the, the point of the title of the slide, Witty, we never knew you. It was the most earth shattering worm that came out in all this period of time that was just crazy. Closest thing to true zero day. Thoroughly successfully targeted non-commodity software, record record setting propagator, massively destructive, should have been one of the most extra instructive examples of what was possible, but yet one of the least known still to this day. And then we get on to the late 2000s, these into the mid-teens. This is the step aside, skidiots, let the pros take over. And then we start to see Storm with botnets into the millions, Stuxnet, clearly nation state level targeting Conficker, crypto locker locky probably you're familiar with mirai and the like but again i'll post the slides you can go back and look through these to see where we're headed with this but this heads into the modern era wanna cry ransomware using nsa exploits leaked by the shadow brokers and we're going to talk about that in detail for the amount of time that i have left petya not petya I thought about covering not Petya in the detail that I want to talk about WannaCry, but it's been so well analyzed and, and, and so dug into, including by one of our keynote speakers, Leslie Carhart. She posted one of the most succinct and, and accurate and awesome write-ups on how not Petya did what not Petya did. So I would refer to, uh, to Hacks for Pancakes on that one. But that brings us to the shake off the yawns. Sorry if I lost you for a bit. Hopefully some of you are still with me, losing a few of you here and there. But let's dig into the conceptual part of this. So history lesson over, kind of. So what do we do? Well, look at the behaviors. We've got to look at the behaviors. Automata are automatic, right? So they should be predictable most often. We, we had in the past polymorphic worms like uh, 1260, chameleon, aka chameleon, uh, all the way back in 1990s, those are worms that changed their appearance, which again, if you wanna know how to change your malware's appearance, seriously, pull the cord, go find what Jeff, Junk, Jeff McJunkin's doing next door, because he's all about that. Configure did that a lot, but it was still the exception, not the rule for most of what's going on. Because when we're looking for anomalies, most of the time, we're looking for evil through looking for what's anomalous. I've said this a bajillion times, I'll keep saying it, not all anomalous is evil, but all evil is going to be anomalous on some plane, all right? So let's talk about anomalous things, anomalously high volumes of things. By definition, worms are all about high volume compromise. They're not about target this system for what it has. It's about target as many systems as we can to own as many as we can. So what we can look at for that is looking at connection attempts over a threshold of time. Too many from a single source, too many to a wide range of destinations, too many to a single port. I mean, worms have had this in common for a very long time, and depending on the topology, natting can complicate this, but we can still do a lot of statistical analysis that can help us hone in on those sorts of worms. Now, if we've got a worm that's targeting a, an, an automatic, uh, automatically generated randomly generated set of targets, it's gonna generate a lot of connection failures because if it's trying to hit port 80, sweeping across wide swaths of the internet, not everything's listening on port 80. In fact, almost nothing is really. So typically a connection fail should be a pretty rare event. How often should anything try to connect to something that's not there? Almost never. And how often should authentication attempts get denied? Almost never. That's pretty rare. Other things that are highly suspicious, you've got the list there, look at them, read through them, let that sink in. But those sorts of connection failures are pretty rare. Another thing that's pretty rare, a natural protocol port use or protocol port use, right? So it's unnatural. In most environments, and not all, lateral movement or lateral connections via SMB are also pretty rare. So even in an environment where Lateral SMB is part of the infrastructure. Look at the volumes. 
where SMB is used desktop to desktop or laterally in that sense, it's going to be from a few common places to a few common places that you should be able to whitelist. If you want to really dive down into the use of unknown ports as well as protocols, go back and look at specifically my previous season 1E2. Episode 2, I get into that in detail. So then let's get into some real world examples in, in practice, all right? Propagation via statically seeded random target generation. That's what Code Red V1 and V2 did. And I mentioned this before. There was no thought to trying to focus on the local subnet, just spray randomly across all the 32-bit address space of the internet, which is not terribly uh, effective. At least it wasn't because, you know, you're spending a lot of time throwing a whole lot of chaff at places where it's not going to stick, right? And in Code Red's case, it was all the port 80 where, you know, the receipt of a SYNAC is going to be pretty rare. So not everything's listing on port 80, right? So not a lot there. So what do we do in practice about detecting this? Even though it seems like it should be awesomely easy, it wasn't because back in 2001, we didn't have the tools that we easily have now, as mature as they are now, to be able to do packet monitoring, stateful firewall logging, and so on and so forth. So bottom line is what we could do was configure our internal routing infrastructure to start logging all that internal port 80 traffic and start looking for low volume outliers. Like who's trying to connect to a bunch of systems on port 80 that aren't even there? But in order to do that in 2001, you had, NetOps, you had to ask NetOps to help you, which they wouldn't want to do, right? So it was pretty tough. And then we move forward into the Blaster model. Now, Blaster was a newer worm that wasn't port 80 based, but rather SMB based. And this comes back to us here in a minute. It did actually favor local or nearby segments. So it was doing segment based permutation, meaning it favored local segments in its random generation of targets over remote segments in its random generation of targets. It was focusing its efforts locally. Really aggressive in the timing, but again, the receipt of a SYNAC in response to the SYN would mostly not happen, right? In environments where that wasn't allowed, in environments where a whole lot of segmentation was not being performed through firewalling, then everything's speaking port 445, everything's responding to SINs with SYNAX. So it was a lot more difficult to sort through. So how did we deal with it in practice? Again, not easy. Because in 2003, when this came out, peer-to-peer -peer SMB file sharing was pretty common. Remember Windows for Workgroups, if you're that old. Yeah. Stateless segmentation we could still be our friend. We'd have all of our internal routers at least log all the crosstalk on port 445. We could do that at least and perform some statistical analysis on it and whitelist the one to the few that weren't, didn't look like worm propagation and alert and act on the one to hundreds or thousands of one to lots and lots and lots of systems on port 445. If you're allowed to block it so much the better, but typically not, right? So for the last, what I got, five, 10 minutes left, let's get into the modern era. Finally, the cool stuff starts here. Wanna cry, last bit of history. And I'm gonna blow through this because I'm sure by the time we get into 2017, most everybody in the room knows this stuff. Some interesting events, right? March of 2017, Microsoft releases MS-17 stroke 010, patch for SMB V1 out of cycle. If Microsoft releases a patch out of cycle, meaning not on patch Tuesday, is there an indicator there? Is that a thing that might pique your interest? Sure enough, a month later it's revealed by the, the shadow brokers that the NSA had escrowed some stuff for that protocol, including internal blue and double pull stuff. Now the thing that's important about this slide is my buddy Jake over at our place at Rendition had, had, had spun up a tool real fast to go out and start scanning the internet for where did the double pulsar background exist or backdoor exist, so that we can see like how many systems are clearly compromisable or already compromised through this eternal blue SMB1 vulnerability. And again, if you saw in the last slide, 
thousands, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. It got crazy. And as Jake was like tweeting out these numbers, I remember tweeting back at him. I was like, thanks, Jake. Thanks, man. Thanks for banging the drum while the rest of us are just banging our heads on the desk over this because it was crazy that people weren't doing anything about it. They weren't patching MS-17 stroke 010. So the other two drops, of course it did. What happened next was so predictable. And when it did, people were freaking out with their hair on fire. And, and yes, it was enough to make you want to cry. So what do? What do? Oh, no. What do? Or what should we have done? Well, obviously, obviously, I would say, as you see on the slide as it pops, right? Rapid out-of-cycle deployment of MS-17 stroke 010. Obviously, if you could. See, that's the asterisk, if, if, you, if you could, because initially Microsoft only released the patch for supported versions. If you didn't have the supported version of Windows in your environment, if you had a legacy version of Windows in your environment, it was a forever day. So this was gonna exist for forever. So of course the situation screamed for a worm. Of course it did. How could we have come up with a zero day monitoring thing for this? What, how could we have predicted it? What could we have been looking for? Now this is key. What would such a worm look like? A worm impacting MS-17 stroke zero and zero. What would it look like? How would it behave? Well, with history, that's the whole point of all that history stuff or, well, it was intended to be 30 minutes. Now it's creeped up because of the blackout for a bit. What would it look like? With history as our instructor, we can be certain of a few things, some pre-compromised things and some post-compromised things. Pre-compromise, it'd be listening on port 445 and it would respond to SMPV1 dialect. Post-compromise, it would begin initiating port 445 connections and trying to use the SMPV1 dialect. So if that was successful, we could assume that something bad was happening depending on the volume. So is this like Blaster again? Absolutely it is. It's it pretty much exactly like Blaster. All the things that I did back in the early 2000s to try to find all the blasters, same, same thing going on here. But those previous approaches, pretty weak sauce compared to what we could do now, right? We've got better tools, better tools, better tools, and let's get into Zeke. Zeke eating worms. There's gotta be a better way, and indeed there is, Zeke. Vern Paxson, 1994, initially named Bro, if you didn't know, uh, as a reference to Big Brother from Georgia Orwell's novel, 1984. Perfectly named. Vern didn't get it wrong. He knew that what he was building at the time was potentially deeply privacy invasive. The goal was to be able to build a system that could watch absolutely everything on the network and log anything that was observable. That's where bro came from. It wasn't about the bro culture with all that misogynistic implications. That's the, recently, yeah, it was renamed to Zeke by the current team for reasons. The reasons, well, it took, it, it took on a kind of a new connotation of being kind of misogynistic and so on and so forth. But now it's named Zeke, anyhow, after a dog character in the Far Side cartoons. So yeah, there has to be a better way. And it either is, Zeke. So, is it yet another open source NIDS? It is and isn't. It can do snort-like things, but properly, it's a framework for network analysis. And I'm gonna show it to you. Let's see how. Let's, or I'm sorry, let's see how. I'm trying, trying to synchronize what you guys see with what I can see with the time lag on the slides. It's kind of crazy. Because the time, time lag is like 10 seconds. But in any case, it can notify you about anything it sees if you've told it to tell you what it sees. My interlude on this, Security Onion, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Doug Burks, thank you for this. It is the platform that I've used for all my previous talks, go back to season one. It'll be the platform that I used for season zero going forward. It's the platform that I used for all my blue team work in real life, it really is. It's a Linux distribution that's, that's got all the tools you can use that you can even think of in open source. It's an enterprise class, SIM, 
easy to use, easy to deploy, totally enterprise class. So let's start out with it real quick. In production, it's most commonly used as a real-time sensor, whether it's security onion-based or just Zeek-based straight out of the uh, open source repository from Zeek.org. Commonly, it's just going to be deployed as a sensor on a span port, on a switch, or on a network tap, and start logging the events it sees in real time, and then react to those events as you configure it too. But because it's libpcap based, it can function in read-in mode, so you can say, hey, Zeke, come over here. I got a bunch of PCAP that I want you to read and, 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 and digest and ingest and tell me about, configurationally dependent. So that's what we're going to do for this particular investigation. So I can show you here that we've got Zeke ingesting a PCAP. The very first thing we have it do is, is I, I go ahead and list out, we've got a couple of PCAPs here. We've got a wannacry.pcap, which you'll see the reference there. Thank you to uh, Sebastian Garcia and his project. They gave me a pcap that I could use of nothing but wannacry traffic. But I didn't want to just use nothing but wannacry traffic. I wanted to bury it in a bunch more stuff, which is where the, uh, the, the next reference, oh, I meant the next reference. I buried in a bunch of stuff from Black Hills. That was, that was kind of cool and useful. So we, read it in, we, we created a directory for the Zeek logs, we read it in uh, in the Zeek and look that it's created a whole bunch of log files and, uh, and then we can move on from there. So now that we've used Zeek to produce the data that we're gonna consume, what can we do with it? We're gonna see if Zeek can answer some questions based on the predictions of what we expected to see if we were dealing with an MS-17 stroke 010 worm. All right, so first thing then, this, this invocation of head dash seven on con log in our first of five simple steps is to say, all right, show me the first seven lines of the con log, the connection log. That's where it logs all the connection it sees, and then give us the last of those seven lines. That's where Zeek stores the structure of the log. It's tab delimited log data with field names that we can then ask Zeek cut to give it to us. So we cat out the con log, then we say Zeek cut, give us just the responding host and, I'm sorry, yeah, the responding host and the responding port, and then we grep out our local domain, or our local uh, subnet, 192.168.1, to see what pops out on port 445. What we can see is, um, there's a whole lot of activity on port 445. The next question we can ask is, Zeke, is anyone responding to SMB v1 requests? Now, this takes a little extra. What I'm showing here is I'm catting out a Zeke script that I wrote. It couldn't be more simple. I'm just saying, hey, Zeke, on the event that you see an SMB1 tree connect response, if you see a tree connect response to SMB v1, just Go ahead and print out who was the responding host. Who responded to an SMB tree request, tree connect request? And we can see, well, we've got four hosts. Uh-oh, uh-oh, right? So we do have some hosts that are responding up for SMB v1 requests. So does anyone try lots of connections after that? So what we're asking is, hey, Conlog, well, hey, Z, really, show me where the Ridge H, that's source host, rest port, responding port, grepping out our local subnet, 192.168.1, and grepping out port 445, sorting it out, uniquifying with a count, and sorting again based on that count so we can see, all right, where did it come from and where did it go? We can see that coming from 192.168.1.144, I've got a little bit of formatting issue there. But going to port 445, we've got 32,532 connection attempts, port 445 from that one host. Next most common, 192.168.105, next most common, 202, next most common, 201. But orders of magnitude more commonly coming from 192.168.1.144. Does that ring a bell? Does that sound familiar? 
like worm propagation activity. So let's ask Zeke the next question. How many times does 192.168.1.114 do this? One easy way to see this is to look at Zeke's SMB mapping log. So first we were looking at the con log, which logs all the connections. Then we look at the SMB mapping log, and we still have to look at line seven in the log to figure out the names of the fields so that we can extract the information to ask Zeke the question properly. So we look at the names of the fields in that log, and then we say, all right, let's cut out that log and then use Zika to cut out just the fields by name, id.origh, again, the originating host, id.resph, the, uh, the IP of the responding host, from where to where. And then we can grep out 192.168.1.114. Now, if you're, if you're not familiar with the syntax of the grep, I'm escaping the dots to make them literal. So we're really literally searching for 192.168.1.114 because we expect it to be the originating host or the source IP. We're looking at where does it go for the destination host. And then we take that information, we sort it out, we uniqueify it with a count of how many to each IP address, sort it again numerically in the reverse to say how many, how many, how many. The head dash five again just shows us the first five. And we see that, sure enough, 192.168.1.114 is spewing a lot of stuff out like that to a bunch of external IP addresses, we assume. How many? That's what we answer in the last question. Zcut ID or H and, uh, and resp H, grepping again 114 as a host. The final, in, the, the, the final command in the pipe is word count dash L. How many? 1166 times. Does 192.168.1.114 try to connect to something on port one, one or on port 445? 1166 times. Ouch. Eek. Ooh. Now, Zeke, are we too late? That's a fair question. Did 192.168.1.114? manage to further propagate internally to other hosts in 192.168.1 subnet. Well, we can ask it. Cat out the SMB mapping log and say, all right, Zeke, based on that, if we look at the responding hosts only, the target hosts only within our, sub, uh, within our subnet, 192.168.1, how many are there? None. But what are our conclusions here at this point? Well, you know, we almost certainly have a compromised system. 192.168.1.114 is spewing so much, not only port 445 connection attempts, but SMB v1 to anything it can talk to. Now it's attacked over a thousand other systems, but it doesn't seem to have targeted anything in the local subnet based on what Zeke tells us. Now, if we go back and look, and you should go back and look at the previous slides, subnet permutations are evident. If you look at the, the, uh, the way that it's, that it's targeting hosts, the 32-bit the address space of the target is not purely random. It's randomizing within slash 24 subnets. But apparently, it's not informing itself by its own subnet, 192.168.1. The subnets are chosen randomly, and then it permutes within those subnets. So it hasn't hit us internally yet, but will it if we let it keep going? So in any case, we've got to run, not walk, to contain whatever uh, 192.168.1.114 is doing. All right? Now, a little postscript on this, and I'm, I know I'm running out of time. Sorry. Sorry, Ken. Um, is there anything else worth noting, Zeke? Anything else you want to tell us? Well, how about this? Let's look at that SMB mapping and look at a different field, the path. The path. What is it trying to connect to? We sort those out and you need to find with a count, sort them numerically in the reverse again, and look at the first five. 
And notice that familiar number, 1166 times it tried to connect to the path 192.168.56.20. That's not one of ours. If you look at subsequent analysis of WannaCry, of WannaCry and the historical literature from years back, it reveals what we just saw here, that every time WannaCry tries, if it makes a successful SMB v1 connection, the first thing it does is try to connect to a hard-coded path of that that you see there, 192.168.56.20, whack IPC dollar. That ends up being an indicator of compromise. Boom, we just found that with Zeke way before any of the reverse engineers even may have found it. We could have found it prior even to we had a name for it called WannaCry that we could Google for. So the post postscript, and then we may not have time for questions because it's I gotta turn it over, but you can find me on Discord. Bottom line, it literally took me minutes to perform the entire analysis that I just showed you guys. But in the real world, that's those minutes are still unacceptable at the speed of worms because it's manual effort to do it, still not real time, all right? But that's where Zeke scripting comes in. So you saw one quick Zeke script just to say, show me the paths, all right? Or show me where the responses happen. Right. If you want to see where Zeek scripting can go, it could notify you upon the first SMB1 connection request. It could notify you on some threshold of them in real time. Now, the use of that is way beyond the scope of this talk, but if you want to see an example of me doing that, go back to season one, episode two on the YouTube channel. You can see it there. Bottom line, incident response is still manual no matter how you find out about a thing. Well, you can't move until you find out about a thing. And here's at least a tool that we can use to do it. I use this all the time, infrastructurally and investigatorily. You should too. So if you have questions and comments, I redirect you now over to the uh, Discord because I got to give up the platform. I can see Joff. There you go. Hi, Joff. Hi, John. How are you? <laughs> I'm. I'm doing okay now after I lost a few minutes, but you know. Oh, good to see you, man. <laughs> but, hey, thanks for <laughs> the talk. Uh, I hope you're healthy and all this. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to give you the floor. We'll have to catch up later, but sorry to, sorry to uh, delay. Yeah, absolutely. I wish we were there in person, but uh, yeah, definitely good to see you. Thanks for the talk. Me Appreciate too. It. Me too. And, and mask free for hugs even would be nice, but. Yeah, yeah. Someday. We just yeah. have to go with virtual hugs. <laughs> okay. I know, right now. Actually, just like Thanks. virtual uh, elbow bumps. Is that what we do now? There we go. There we go. Yeah, right. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Excellent. Bo, too. Hey, Bo. Bye, Jonathan.